to uniqueness. But at least uh, you can study this problem. This problem is a kind of a minimax problem. And this minimax problem, uh, well, Brenier was not trying to solve it, but rather to formulate a dual problem. And the dual problem has an optimizer uh, for his examples, which he considered the incompressible Euler and the invested burgers. And uh, it also, what is funny that it's uh, really reminds optimal transport in some sense, but uh, it has some differences because uh, it's matricial. So it's mat like matrix valued measures. And also it is uh, in some sense ballistic in some sense, which I explain uh, later. So in some sense, you know the final uh, data, but you don't know the initial one. So that's why it's called <laughs> ballistic. Uh, and uh, and Brunier found some explicit formulas how to relate the smooth solution. So if you have a smooth solution of your original uh, problem, then uh, at least on small time interval, uh, you can find a smooth solution. And he found the formulas how to relate the primal problem and the dual problem. Uh, so we uh, what we do, we develop his approach. So we try to find some structures in PDEs uh, quite, uh, in a quite abstract way. Uh, which uh, which permit to mimic his approach and to define dual problems, to study their solvability, consistency, and also what he didn't do, but it's possible to do, we, we do it, it's a weak, strong uniqueness. So if you have a strong solution that even the dual problem have unique solution. Uh, so this somehow justifies that the approach is uh, consistent in some sense. Uh, so we adopt rather general setting, but uh, uh, here I will basically, speak about uh, the case when you have some conservation of energy. It's not necessary for the theory because there are interesting examples when there is no conservation, but when you have conservation, you can prove more uh, results. And there is also some trace condition which will show up, which really helps to get uh, kind of uh, uh, results. Uh, and uh, since we do quite abstract approach, we can include a quite big list of PDEs in this theory. And actually, many of these PDEs are not known to have uh, global weak solutions. So this at least suggests to some kind of solution, some kind of relaxed solution to these PDEs. And also at the end, I will speak a little bit about uh, some kind of uh, raw themes and uh, unpublished stuff, which is uh, just how this approach uh, leads to some Schrodinger problems. So starting from any PDE, uh, you can get a Schrodinger problem for it. Of course, this is uh, a bit, uh, uh, has nothing to do with uh, with stochastics, etc. It's like just uh, playing with uh, the operators, and you will see how it works. And in particular, if you start from the Euler, you get some non-standard version of Navier-Stokes, which is not like Brodin. It's a little bit different. Uh, uh, so, so let me describe the setting. So the setting, you just uh, in an abstract way, then you just the PDEs will be particular cases of this setting. So you just look for some function v, which is defined on a time interval zero t with values in x, the power n, x is just L2 space. Uh, so x is uh, just L2, uh, sorry. It doesn't work. So x, x is just L2 uh, on some, it's abstract. So omega is some uh, probability measure space, but in applications, omega is a domain uh, in Rn where your PD is uh, defined. So actually, so omega in some sense corresponds to your special variables and uh, t, uh, t is a is time variable. Uh, but for the abstract approach, you just need that omega is a probability measure space. Uh, so if you have a domain that you just take a Lebesgue measure and normalize it and that's it. Uh, and then you just need uh, two things there, right? So you have a, so this is a abstract way to write the PD. You have some linear operator L, which is uh, basically you don't need anything, just closely, closely defined and bound and, uh, and, and uh, closed operator and densely defined. And some projection uh, and X is uh, of course a Hilbert space and X to the power N is just uh, N couple so to, in order to consider systems, right? You need uh, to uh, have this n, right? Uh, so n is the, the dimension of your system. And uh, this uh, space is the space of matrix valued uh, functions. So you have a function which is defined on uh, omega and L2 function, but you have a matrix of them, right? A symmetric matrix. So this S means symmetric matrix n times n. Uh, and this matrix valued thing is very uh, typical in this theory because these matrix valued uh, uh, things uh, appear uh, here everywhere. 
and so the the problem the primal problem i call it the primal problem so in the beginning you had a, a some initial value problem right this one uh but you which which is an abstract way to write a pd and then you look for the solution as Brenier teaches us, which minimizes the time average of the kinetic energy. The, time, the kinetic energy is just the square uh, of, of, of V, right? V is an element in the Hilbert space. So, so this is the kinetic energy. Uh, and you, uh, so by parenthesis, I just denote this color product in, uh, in L2. Uh, and there is some augmented Lagrangian trick, uh, which permits uh, to go from this uh, minimax problem, right? Because it's a minimax problem. Uh, to uh, to the dual problem, and I will not. Uh, I don't have time to give the details how you do it because it takes some time. But uh, Jan will describe in his talk uh, some uh, example uh, how how we actually proceed to go from the primal problem to the dual problem. Uh, and uh, but at the end, what you get so the dual problem looks something like this. Uh, so in, in it, it reminds optimal transport. I will explain uh, in a minute why. Uh, but uh, the difference with optimal transport is this extra uh, thing, right? So, uh, so in the case of optimal transport, you don't have uh, this uh, term, which involves the initial data in some sense. Uh, and uh, but here you have so that's why it's called ballistic uh, ballistic problem. And I also have this minus here, right? Uh, that's why uh, it's. Uh, because it's dual, right? So for some convenience, just for technical uh, convenience, I put minus here and, and then maximize instead of minimizing, like in the number linear. And there is some constraint, which is uh, which is looks like a linear constraint. And also, you know, the final value of G and G is a matrix valued uh, measure in, in general, right? So, you know, the final value, and in, in this particular case, uh, this is not a general thing, but just the identity matrix, right? Uh, and uh, also, this is the, the matrices are positive definite. So this means that the matrices are positive definite. And so this is the problem. And uh, I will now explain why this is really like optimal transfer. Because if you consider, if you start from the hamilton jacobi equation, uh, then uh, you can rewrite it in this form. And this form fits into our general framework. So you just take P to be uh, identity and L to be this minus one half of the gradient of the trace. And then you recover our uh, abstract uh, setting, right? But here the energy is not conserved. So this is uh, a little bit out of the scope of the talk, but uh, but it doesn't matter. So you can still do these dual tricks. And what you get, you get this problem. Uh, so uh, you get uh, something like this. So this is really like Benamou Brinier if you don't look at this term, right? So this is this is like Benamou Brinier with the with the classical constraint. In the Benamovian formulation, but uh, it's ballistic, right? Because you you know the final value, so this is just one. One means just uh, 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 just uh, so Roy. Well, it's think of it. It's not a measure like a function, right? Smooth, smooth right? And uh, so it's just an identity equal to one everywhere. Uh, so, for example, if you are on the torus, then it's just a, a torus of normalized. Uh, um, size then uh, this is just a Lebesgue measure right the, so the final the final data is a Lebesgue measure but uh, the initial data is not known but instead of knowing the initial data you know this strange uh, so strange you have this additional term here uh, and uh, and so I, we call it a ballistic uh, optimal transport uh, so you see that here, in this particular case, it's all scalar valued because of this uh, trick here. Because you can somehow always find the. Uh, Jan will also explain this example uh, from in his language, actually. And uh, but in general, it's a matrix valued. So it's matrix valued measures. It's only this particular case when you start from Hamilton Jacobi that you get a scalar value. But in the majority of the cases, you get a matrix valued uh, optimal transport. Uh, so this is really quite similar to dynamical formulation, as I already told. But yeah, there is some difference, and this is uh, the, this is the idea to call it uh, ballistic is due to Gossup, which who considered some kind of different uh, different uh, problem, but uh, in a different context, but still with this final value and uh, 
That's why I borrowed the language from him. And also uh, Jan, I think, uh, uses this language, ballistic transport, at least in his, uh, in his notes, uh, not in the paper, but in some notes. Uh, and, uh, and so we can view it as a very general abstract, well, our general problem can be viewed as a gen very general optimal ballistic uh, transport problem. Uh, and uh, just a, a remark that if you have non-ballistic uh, version, so you drop this uh, weird uh, ballistic term, and but you now involve uh, two uh, initial and final value. Of course, formally you can write this uh, in the matrix value setting, right? So this is like Madame Brinier, but very abstract one, right? So this is, corresponds to the constraint, and this corresponds to the minimization. Uh, then uh, in this at this level of generality, this can be unsolvable so because uh, this soup can be zero it can be minus infinity so because this is too general somehow uh, for hamilton jacobi this gives you just classical optimal transport but in the general case this can be too general so uh, this can be you can uh, find easy examples when this is not solvable so in this sense uh, the ballistic transport problem is easier because in ballistic transport problem we can solve and uh, i will show later that it's solvable uh, that it's solvable but uh, this is not solvable just uh, because uh, well basically because uh, kind of uh, you can the space is not a geodesic space well there is no geodesic space, so in general but uh, but the, in the ballistic language you can still if you only know the final value and uh, and also some other thing right so uh, because uh, in some sense the geodesic problem corresponds to when you know the final initial final data here you only know the initial data right uh, because you are trying to solve in the primal problem you're trying to solve the cauchy problem so you solve the initial you have the initial datum but then when you go to the dual problem by some magic you know only the final data but still this is consistent so this is consistent and the consistency will be justified by the weak strong uniqueness right so uh, if uh, uh, so this is the conservative. Uh, this is the the condition on the operator L, which you, gives you the conservativity, which is not satisfied by the Hamilton Jacobi, but by other equations, they, it does, it is satisfied. Uh, because Hamilton Jacobi here is not the main example. Here Hamilton Jacobi is just a way to show why this resembles optimal transport. But uh, we are not interested in or Hamilton Jacobi. We are interested in conservative things because. Uh, Hamilton Jacobi you can solve without these tricks, but uh, conservative PD can be very difficult, as I said at the beginning of the talk. And there is just a way. This is a way to try to define a weak solution for them. So this is the list of a uh, big list of PDs which we can include. Uh, and uh, in particular, well, Kamasa Holm, of course, can be solved by different methods. Kamasa Holm is just a, no, sorry, so not Kamasa Holm, uh, sorry, I mean KDV. KDV, of course, is an integrable system. It can it, here it's just for curiosity that we include it. But the rest of them are normally uh, are difficult to solve. So the rest of them are, don't have weak solutions uh, globally. And so here, there is, but they are also known that many of these equations are known to be geodesic equations on some Lie groups. But this is just a coincidence, of course, because we don't use these Lie groups. We just use this formalism, uh, which I explained in, in the beginning. So. Uh, and uh, so the, uh, the function is called, then we define weak solutions by, by some duality, right? So you have some dual uh, variables E and B, and there is a constraint for them. Uh, this, this is just a way to dis define a weak solution uh, in a consistent way. Uh, and also you can define uh, uh, strong solutions. So for us, strong solutions belong to some particular class, which, uh, which is quite uh, strong, right? So because L is a kind of differentiation operator, right? So this tells you in some sense that um, the, the derivative of or a gradient of your solution, for example, or, or even higher order is, is bounded. Uh, and this is strong solution, uh, which is, uh, uh, and if you rewrite your equation a little bit different way, but this is formally equivalent in the conservative case. Where? Ah, yeah, 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 because, uh, well, so the point is that, uh, 
something can sub, some, no no something can happen something can happen at moment t equals to t uh, yeah so yeah yeah so it can blow up in some sense when t but but here when you multiply by it so at the final moment it becomes zero and then you don't lose the regularity so it's really really uh, fine in this way right so you cannot drop this you cannot drop this uh yeah so this is but this is almost of course for all t's except for the final value this is just l infinity yeah? uh yes and also here yes uh, uh, and so uh, then there is a proposition of consistency that if you have uh, defined strong solutions in this way and then you can prove that for these strong solutions the energy is conserved in the classical way right uh, so the energy does not depend on time because for weak solutions it's not a priori so as uh Bill Delelis and others teach us right uh, but for strong solutions uh, uh the energy is conserved and also there is consistency that the way i define a strong solution if it's a strong then it's also weak right you have to prove it right uh because and then uh well you can rewrite the primal problem in a little bit different language so it looks uh probably ugly but what's important that there is a quadratic term here and there is some linear thing so you include the constraint here and then so your your primal problem you minimize in z right because you minimize you look for the solutions which minimize the kinetic energy so kinetic energy is here the rest is just lagrange multiplies for the for the solution so just a set of so the Jan Brenier style way to write the weak formulation and uh and then you just swap soup and inf and the, uh, you get something like this and then you calculate when, when you swap soup and inf then you can calculate here right then you can calculate uh, what is inf actually then you can calculate uh get rid of inf because you can calculate it explicitly and at the, at the end you get some kind of dual problem like this but what is good with this problem is that this is a linear term and this is a kind of a concave term so because it's soup so it should be concave to be good right uh uh and uh and so you can uh, solve it uh but you can also prove consistency so if you have a strong solution uh with some additional uh limit on the so the the time interval cannot this just tells you that the, the time elapsed is not very big then everything is good so the primal and the dual problem have the same critical value it's, it's it coincides with the t times the kinetic energy of the original uh, so the what the, the value which you expect for strong solutions and uh and also you if you have a start from strong solutions then you have explicit formulas how to recover uh, yeah, yeah so you have v v is your strong solution then you can find uh, the solution of a dual problem explicitly here uh and and also you if you find start from the solution of the dual problem uh then you can go back to the primal one so there is a this uh, formula VE, which relates uh, the primal and the dual problem. Uh, so because E, e can, e, B is not used. So the solution of the dual problem is a pair. E, B, think E is in some sense uh, what corresponds to the momentum, right? So you, you take the momentum and then you integrate it. Uh, you take the average of the momentum and by some weird uh, thing here the optimal transport intuition does not work because this only works for conservative problems right so if for hamilton jacobi this is not true but for conservative problems you have this weird thing that if you take the average of the momentum you get the solution of the of the primal problem uh and then there is also a trace condition on the operator l which uh, which which helps uh, to prove uh, existence and which is easy to check in the majority of the examples. It's it's really check uh, normally you can check it by hand uh, or by some ad hoc tricks, but the ad hoc tricks are not very involved also. So for many PDs, for the PDs from that list which I presented, it was quite a big list. Uh, you can check it. Uh, it's just an algebraic condition of on the eigenvalues of some matrix. Uh, uh, and then you have the existence theorem one that if you have this trace condition then you have a maximizer uh in the class in the natural class somehow it's a bit better than so you remember that i call it optimal transport but it's a bit better than optimal transport because this is eb in some sense l2 this is not just measures this is l2 uh not me so measures is more, less regular than l2 but this happens exactly because of the conservativity so when you have uh just measure when you have 
when you don't have a conservativity situation, you don't expect uh, L2, you just expect uh, measure value. Uh, and also if you solve it, uh, so I told you that you can solve it. And then when you solve it, then you, uh, you we can define the generalized solution by the formula, which I already described. And this gives the opportunity to go from the dual problem to the primal back. And but what is weird, of course, at this level of generality, uh, this uh, this thing which you construct is automatically quite regular, but it's not automatically a solution, of course. <laughs> so if you start, you start, you have a PD, you solve the dual problem, you get some object which is quite regular, not not that bad, but this object uh, might, in some uh, bad situations, not satisfy, for example, the initial condition. So. Uh, but still, this uh, this object uh, is uh, uniquely not uniquely defined, but uh, quite unambiguous, unambiguously defined. And in uh, some situations, you can prove the consistency. Uh, so, in particular, in this situation, on in small time intervals, it's consistent. Uh, but in big time intervals, uh, not always probably. Uh, so, also these trace conditions which i mentioned which is uh, all which is in majority of situations it it is uh, true but still for the sake of curiosity you can even can try to get rid of it so in this case you don't assume almost nothing and uh, in this case you can prove that the dual problem has a solution but in the sense of measures so it related to like in optimal transport but still uh, and also here you don't need uh, conservativity so basically this applies in particular to hamilton Jacob, but of course for, for classical monch controllers you don't need this formalism to do it but uh, actually this is not exactly the same because this is ballistic right so for ballistic you still need to reprove the results uh, and also there is an interesting uh, thing uh, which leads to weak strong uniqueness so you can uh, 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 if you can solve the dual problem, so I already showed that in the majority of the situations you can do it, uh, then you can uh, some bound, sharp, actually sharp bound on the optimal value of the dual problem. This is just T times the kinetic energy of the initial data. And if actually there is exact equality, uh, then uh, if you can, you, you, solve, you solve the dual problem, you calculate uh, the corresponding optimal value just by hand. And uh, if it was, if it you know that there is an inequality, but if they coincided, and there are situations which when you can show that they coincide, uh, that, that these two values coincide, then actually this the solution of uh, the dual problem generates you the solution of the primal problem by the, by, the, by this time averaging of the of the uh, of the momentum, and you get a strong solution automatically and with the same initial data. So in this case, you have full consistency. Uh, so, but uh, of course you need this condition for that so this probably this is too strong but in some particular situations you can verify it so in particular uh, this, this give you this leads easily to weak strong uniqueness so if you have uh, uh, so in the framework of the first consistency theorem or in the mean i mean if you have a strong solution and this on a or not very big time interval uh, then uh, then the dual problem has only one solution, and not, uh, which is generated by the strong solution by some unambiguous way. And you don't have any other solution of the dual problem in spite of it looking quite uh, dangerous. And uh, so you can prove that the dual problem has unique maximality in this case. And uh, so, uh, and this is new actually even for Euler. So Jan didn't prove this. Uh, and so, uh, uh, oh, uh, there is uh, the setting can be even. Uh, this is important now. Now we are moving to the Schrodinger problem. Uh, so what's important that for the, to get Schrodinger-like problems, you need to introduce some add some linear term here. So you can uh, not not only have quadratic term, but also you you want to add some linear term in the problem, uh, like Laplace, right? Uh, to, to and. Uh, and this is also applicable, for example, to KDV, right? Because KDV equation, it has a quadratic pro term and also a linear term. Uh, and so you want to introduce, uh, also include the linear term, but this is, uh, there are two ways to do it. Uh, one is uh, just to follow the Minimax procedure, which Jan will describe uh, on some example, uh, but, uh, there are, but this does not make the results applicable the, our results, because our results were really formulated uh, in the quadratic case without linear terms. 
but there is also an algebraic trick how to include uh, the linear term right so you just extend uh, you increase the dimension and if you increase the dimension and change the variables then actually you can rewrite uh, so you define new operator l tilde which involves also the linear term but you have to, the, price, the price to pay is to increase the dimension for example when you start from kdv which is one dimensional then you need to go to the two dimensional problem two dimensional system uh, but well and, and the same in the other cases so you, if you start from navier stocks for example in 3d then you get a 4 uh, 4d problem uh, no sorry if you start from navier stocks so navier stocks has uh, three all right the velocity has three uh, three components right so then you have to move to four dimensional system for the system of four equations right uh, etc just the price to pay increase the number of uh, equations in the system by one and then you just by simple algebra you can include the linear term and then you can apply all the results in particular to kdv and the others uh, and so the exact again i repeat that this list of equations quite big one uh, is covered and all this uh, and and we can prove existence of the solutions of the dual problem uh this is, so this is gives you some l2 solutions which are better than measures in the case of the template matching uh, which is a kind of uh, like like template matches is a kind of multi-dimensional burgers uh which is used in uh, in uh, imaging so in the case in this case you can uh, you don't have uh, some this trace condition so you only can can have measure value solutions and uh, and this consistency with strong uniqueness is also applicable to all of these examples and uh, so the re the rest now I'm trying I will speak a little bit about this uh, how to construct Schrodinger problems so uh, so you start from a PD right and so starting from any PD, you can construct some candidate to, to be a entropic realization. But I don't call it entropic, like, but I call it pseudo-entropic because there is no entropy in general. Uh, so all that all you have, so you start from uh, from this problem, right? So you start from this problem, some quadratic uh, PD, uh, evolutionary one, uh, in particular Euler, for example, or anything else, uh, any one from that list, for example. Or, uh and then so i claim that you have the the the, the canonical regularization which is which is which should, should be called schrodinger problem in some sense uh but maybe schrodinger problem is too much but at least you can call it pseudotropic regularization is uh, to add this uh this term uh so you start if you have operator l then you can const of course uh, look that operator l is uh, maps from matrix valued functions to 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 vector value and l star is on the contrary so you'll start map so this uh you take a vector valued function then you get a matrix valued then a vector valued again etc and then some projection uh let me explain it why why i claim that this is a Schrodinger problem because uh, uh because if you start from the hamilton jacobi uh so if you start from the Hamilton Jacobi, uh, so that you have particular values of P and L, uh, and then the dual problem. Uh, so uh, uh, let me go back. So uh, I, uh, let me first do the formalism and that, then explain why uh, why it's a Schrodinger problem. So uh, 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 this is covered by our formalism. That's why I could define the dual problem in this premier way, right? Uh, and there are actually two ways to do it one is use this extra dimension trick and the other is uh, do this direct swapping on if and super and, uh, and do the calculations actually here i prefer to do this direct swapping because i'm not interested now in some existence or uniqueness i'm just interested in formally deriving showing like problems uh, and, and and justifying that this uh, this is indeed a showing like problem so that's why I, for simplicity i do this direct swap of course i don't present the calculations because this is really messy uh but what you get at the end you get this kind of problem so uh which has this structure uh so so, so this is the ballistic uh, thing which you can uh, forget but uh but this uh, this is g minus one like in uh, like in uh, in optimal transport this is the momentum right 
And this is a kind of regularization. Uh, so you can, of course, also change the variable so you can denote it by some uh, omega. And then you have an equation uh, for, uh, instead of omega, you have, have something here, and here you have uh, minus epsilon, uh, I think, L star L, something like that. Uh, L star L, or plus, I don't know, uh, G minus I. So this really looks like like so this this corresponds to Laplacian in the case of uh, uh, in the case of and this is looks like the number thing uh, and this corresponds to Laplacian uh, in the classical case of uh, Hamilton Jacobi. So this is really and also also Jan does these calculations for this particular example, not in this general framework, but for this particular example, he does this calculation in his notes. He has a big notes about. Uh, hidden convexity, uh, a preprint and uh, a kind of a draft of a book. And, uh, and there he does this calculation for the Schrodinger problem and justifies that you get Schrodinger problem by uh, as a dual problem from, from the Hamilton Jacobi, uh, but with this regularization, all right, already. So you take, in some sense, you take Hamilton Jacobi Bellman, right? Because in the case of Hamilton Jacobi, this, this thing is Hamilton Jacobi Bellman. So the primary problem would be Hamilton Jacobi Bellman, the regularized one. And then uh, you do the dual problem and then you get uh, the Schrodinger problem. Uh, that's why this is a quite a general abstract analog of the Schrodinger problem, uh, which you can do for any PD. Well, basically for any PD, which has this structure, right? The quadratic structure. In particular, you can play with, uh, uh, with uh, some example, but let me first uh, say a question. So the question is what happens if, uh, in natural question, of course, what happens if epsilon goes to zero? So can you find a set of assumptions in this uh, abstract framework when uh, your pseudotropic regularization goes to the, the, the formal limit, when, when the regularization goes to the original problem? So you can actually uh, ask this question for the primal problem and for the dual as well. And this is, these are different things, right? So, for example, it can go for the dual problem, but not for the primal one. Uh, so this is, of course, this is quite uh, open because this is very general. Uh, and uh, in particular, let me repeat again. So if you start from Hamilton Jacobi, then you get Hamilton Jacobi Bellman, and the dual problem will be uh, the Schrodinger problem. If you start from the incompressible Euler on the in a periodic box, then you get the Navier-Stokes equation in the periodic box. But if it's on the domain, then I will. Uh, this, this will be on the next slide. So uh, if you start from ideal MHD, for example, then you do uh, what you get, you have uh, viscous MHD with zero magnetic diffusivity. So because MHD has two equations, one is like uh, momentum and another one is magnetic. So magnetic is just completely ideal and uh, you only have regularization on the level of, uh, of, of momentum. So the kind of Navier stocks with, uh, with, uh, without, magnetic, without magnetic diffusivity. That's what you get uh, by this uh, formalism. Also, actually, uh, here I can include our uh, paper with uh, Leo about fischer -Rau. So if you start with uh, uh, just some uh, ODE, right, uh, then you get, uh, and you do this regularization, then you get a uh, um, problem for fischer -Rau, which is consistent with the one which we derived by completely different methods uh, and justified quite uh, uh, thoroughly. Uh, then, uh, so if you do incompressible Euler in a domain, then you do the Navier, what you get, it's funny, you get Navier stocks with a slip, right? So you have a slip. So, uh, so the, no, uh, the normal component of the velocity is zero, but this is ridiculous, right? Because this is under, under, uh, incomplete, because there is no, no, you don't know anything about the tangential uh, component. Normally, in fluid dynamics, you should complement either by no sleep or by Navier, so called Navier sleep, or this uh, Udovich. Uh, well, this is not Udovich, but it looks similar to what Udovich did very. Uh, also, there is some uh, recent papers about this, this, uh, this boundary condition for Navier stocks. Uh, why is this uh, interesting? Because uh, you know that if you have no sleep condition for Navier stocks on, in the domain, and you let epsilon to go to zero. So you let uh, the viscous, uh, I think I, yeah, so this is uh, the Navier stocks, right? Uh, epsilon. Uh, yeah, so I forgot here. Yeah, Lap sorry, 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 sorry. I forgot, I, uh, I forgot the Laplacian here. So the Navier stocks will be 
uh, with Laplacian, of course. So this is Euler. And then I, uh, if you want Navier Stokes, you. Sorry. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, 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 yes. So this is Laplacian. Yeah, like this. And then there is some epsilon here, right, in front. So uh, when epsilon, uh, so this is Navier Stokes. But uh, when epsilon goes to zero, if you have no slip condition, uh, then uh, then you there is a boundary layer problem, so you don't converge to Euler, right? But if you have uh, Navier slip or this uh, the 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 curl of the velocity, uh, the tangential component of the curl of the velocity is zero, then uh, there are results that you converge to Navier stocks. You converge to Euler. Uh, so you see that uh, well, the no slip. Uh, the no slip is really the cause of the problem. Uh, the no slip is, uh, is probably the, the problem, right? And and now we we, we got rid uh, got rid of no slip. So here is no there is no no slip. There is a you just cannot go in the normal direction. In the tangential you can slip, right? But this is incomplete. So this is uh, incomplete. In particular, this includes no slip, right? Because you don't know anything uh, about the normal uh, about the tangential. So of course this has too many weak solutions, right? Because this is a, you can uh, construct a weak solution for no slip. This will fit here. You can construct no uh, weak solution for for Navier slip. It will also fit here because you don't know anything. It's, it's underdefined. So this gets a crazily a big amount of weak solutions. Sorry, is it not that you should address in the boundary conditions or the problem? Oh uh, no 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 no. It, uh, uh, if you do the calculation. No, I explained, it, yes, I say that this looks ridiculous, but uh, there is no epsilon about the condition. But I explain you why this is not completely crazy. So, uh, why? Because uh, actually, this uh, we, uh, as, as Springett uh, suggested, we uh, are not looking for all solutions. We are looking for the solution which minimizes the average uh, kinetic energy, right? And if we do, so we look for the solution which minimizes the average kinetic energy along all the solutions with the sleep. Uh, so now uh, it's very un, un, uh, unlikely that you will select no sleep one, right? So you will select something. I don't know what. So of course this problem I didn't try to solve it, but uh, you can. Uh, but you can formulate the dual problem, and the dual problem uh, I think is already solvable. Uh, and so our conjecture here is, is that uh, the solutions of this problem would converge to the Euler, at least uh, at the level, I don't know, the level of primal or dual problem, but even at the level of primal problem, it's plausible because, uh, because I don't think uh, the boundary layer will show up. This minimization condition, uh, the fact that you minimize the kinetic energy, which is also very well compatible with the fact that Euler is actually the geodesic on the space of uh, diffeomorphisms, right? So this is a... Uh, so, just on the way, uh, well, uh, just on the level of hand waving, this really, this is really plausible that uh, this this would work like a reasonable uh, model for for viscous fluid, uh, and so this should converge to Euler. Uh, uh, yes, yes. So I I I, I finish. <laughs> 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 what, uh, what are, are there any questions? Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dmitry. Very nice. So um, you, you mentioned this regularization of the MHD uh, equation where you have a viscosity for the velocity and not for the magnetic fluid. Yes. Uh, can you do the opposite? Because I guess for physicists, it's more likely to have a viscosity on the side of the induction equation uh, that, that just for physical purpose, I think. So what prevents you to do the regularization on the side of the magnetic uh, induction equation rather than on the uh, on the Euler part of the MHD equation. 
because the regularization is unambiguous here. So you just uh, write your MHD in this abstract form, then you get the, see what is the operator L and what is the projection. Uh, this is done uh, in my preprint. And then uh, you just take this operator, construct this problem, uh, which is uh, here, right? Uh, so this one, <laughs> you do the calculation and see that for some uh, stupid reason, the Laplacian is instead of, uh, it, it stands in, in the Navier-Stokes equation, yeah, but there okay. is nothing in the magnetic part because there is some kind of symplectic thing in the magnetic part. So the things cancel out and they, there is nothing there. Okay. I, I I, <laughs> this is just pure uh, algebra in some sense, right? So, uh, of course, maybe I say that this is naive. So, uh, maybe this is not physical at all. And also, uh, uh, on the side of my question, there is uh, you, you know that uh, on the convex integration side, there has been some uh, recent progress by uh, Laszlo Sekeidi and co worker on this uh, on MHD. So, did you, did you look a little bit at that? And, uh, what could be the connection uh, uh, you may with, I guess, with Daniel Faraco and uh, Sikhi? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know this progress, but uh, what in some sense, uh, for me, MHD is just an example, right? So I'm not sure, so. Sure, sure. Uh, but it's uh, a very nice one. <laughs> uh yeah yeah but maybe it's the most uh, important one, yes, in, in the sense of applications. But uh, uh, well, even at the, for Euler, the link between convex integration and this approach is not very, very, uh, not very clear, right? You can yes. just prove that uh, uh, there is absolute some subsolutions, uh, sure. uh, but also, but the link is not is quite uh, is not complete, right? The, the picture of the link is not complete, yeah. and at the level of MHD, well, if you have more complicated equation, it's even more difficult to do all the calculations. So, I, of course, I didn't do it. <laughs> Uh, so I, I, yes, I know that there is some progress, uh, but uh, also for Navier Stokes, uh, there is a, a nice paper by 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 Bickel and uh, and uh, yeah. Bookmaster, right? And about uh, convex integration for Navier Stokes. But I also didn't try to relate uh, what they do and and with this approach, it's difficult uh, to do anything. Thank you. Mm. Okay, so I don't see any other questions. Okay, so let's thank you, Mr. Dane. Uh, the microphone. Uh, yes. Yeah, just... But now we have a break. Yeah, we, so we have a short break and, well, not too short, actually. And so we will be back in uh, half an hour. Thank you.